in June 1952, requirement NA39 was issued by the Admiralty. Based on a draft specification by Admiral Bolt of the Naval Air Warfare Division, it specified a two-seat, low-level, carrier-borne, high-performance strike aircraft. It was required that the weapons bay carry either nuclear or conventional load, and that the aircraft must be able to fly at Mach 0.85 at a height of 200 feet. In August of that year, the Ministry of Aviation issued specification M148T, which provided the detail to the Navy's requirement. This specification represented an intimidating technical challenge to British aircraft manufacturers. Blackburn's research into and adoption of certain technical innovations gave it an advantage over its competitors. And in July 1955, the B-103, as it was then known, was chosen by the Admiralty, and an order was placed for 20 development aircraft. The deadline for the first flight was April 1958. From the biplane torpedo bombers of the 20s and 30s, such as the Dart, Ripon, and the Shark, to the fighter bombers of the 40s, the Skua and Firebrand. The Blackburn and General Aircraft Company Limited had built a tradition of supplying aircraft for the Navy. This had been interrupted in 1949 when the Firebrand production line had been replaced by that of the Beverly Heavy Transport for the RAF. The B-103 restored this tradition. The project team under Barry Late was based at the factory in Brough on the banks of the Humber. I'd always fancied engineering. I fetched up as chief aerodynamicist of uh, the Bristol Aeroplane Company. And then I fancied to do something more in the direction of design. And I was offered this job at Blackburn Aircraft, which I took. And I'd been there about two years. We'd done an aircraft called the Beverly. And that was doing all right. We wanted some more work. Robert Blackburn, who was still alive then, was very keen to get back into naval aircraft. So we knew the Navy was looking for a new aircraft, and we went for that. So in 1953-54, I found myself as chief designer of Blackburn Aircraft having to decide what the Navy really wanted and we put in for this and we were successful. That's when the fun started really because we had to make the thing work. Not, not just write a brochure about it but make it work, which took the next six, seven years. So that was the beginning from my point of view of the Buccaneer. The first thing to do, of course, for the aircraft was to write a brochure if you didn't write out what you wanted to do and make a tender for it. For the supply of the aircraft, you, you didn't exist. There were three of us who did the, the brochure. The other two were uh, Harold Brumby, who was a wonderful man. He was head of the drawing office, and every piece of hardware that went into that aeroplane he designed. And the other was uh, Roy Boot, who did the performance, and... Uh, I wrote the brochure, actually. I, I did the writing for it and specified what it would look like. The head of the works was Tom Bancroft. He'd built hundreds of swordfish during the war. Uh, he was a man who was never beaten. I kept throwing at him things he found difficult to do, and he'd make a lot of fuss, but he would make it. I think he made everything he was asked to make, and um, it all worked. Of course, Eric Turner was head of the company because Robert Blackburn had died by this time, and... Uh, I think his management was superb. And then, of course, Nero N.E. Rowe was a technical director, and he'd been uh, head of technical development of the ministry during the war. I should mention the fact that the, the naval office was so helpful because anything we wanted to do, they were only there to help us do it. In order to make the aircraft uh, technically viable, of course, we had a lot of, new, a lot of innovation. I suppose the biggest item was the uh, boundary layer control. Boundary layer control is a f feature of the Buccaneer. Uh, the purpose of it is to increase the lift uh, from the wings. Uh, this aeroplane has boundary layer control all the way along the leading edge. Um, along the trailing edge, 
uh, in front of the, the flaps and the ailerons, and it also has boundary layer control underneath the leading edge of the tailplane. And the, the purpose of it is to increase the lifting power of the wing at slow speeds. It enables you, therefore, uh, to come in slower uh, which for landing on aircraft carriers was something that uh, was particularly necessary. And it was very effective indeed. Uh, the next technical thing I think I should talk about is the engine. The uh, engines that existed were all rather clumsy, certainly by modern standards. They wouldn't fit in. But there were some new engines coming along, which were very high technology. And the one we went for first was the Gyron Junior, made by de Havilland. It was a small engine, quite efficient, very advanced for its day. And of course, later we took out the Gyron Juniors and put in the Spain engine, which improved the aeroplane enormously. The other thing I think I might say relates to the structure of the aeroplane. Most of the Buccaneer is machined from the solid. This was a very new technique. It was a terrible thing to inflict on the works, uh, particularly because they couldn't buy any machine tool which would do that. Since they couldn't buy a machine tool, they set to and made one. And this worked for all the buccaneers. Uh, the other novelty which had been used on another aircraft was uh, rotating Bombay. What we had to do was to put the weapons on a door and then those weapons were carried inside for the flight so you got rid of the drag. When you came up to the target you turned the bomb door over and then the bombs were outside and you could drop them cleanly from the aircraft. I think you have to look at the problems it had to face. The Navy wanted an aircraft carrying up to 8,000 pounds of bombs and flying low and going 300 miles carrying a lot of electronics and this meant a fairly sizable aircraft. The carriers weren't all that big, not by American standards anyway. We could not have a length of more than 51 feet. If we did, the aircraft wouldn't go down the lift from the flight deck down to the hangar and we couldn't have more than 16 feet of height. Uh, so those are pretty tight dimensional limits. Uh, what we did there was to arrange, first of all, that the radar can be swung round to reduce the length, and then the air brakes open out, and that reduces the length. So we cheated, and the length of the aircraft when flying was quite a bit more than the 51 feet. Well, the first flight of the Buccaneer was quite an event. If there hadn't been one small mistake, it would have gone off without any bother at all. We'd taken the aircraft down to Bedford Aerodrome because that was one of the very long diversion aerodromes during the war for damaged aircraft that need miles to land. This was early in April, and the works had said, we will fly in April 58. I have enormous respect for what the works did, and it flew on 30th of April, 58, which was the right month. I came to be involved with Blackburns because it was naval policy when they're developing a new aeroplane to put a naval test pilot with the company on secondment. And I spent two years uh, with Blackburn Aircraft at their uh, factory and uh, flying from home on Spalding Moor in Yorkshire. I got there in August... 1959, and uh, I left in, I think it was July 1961. At that stage they had built seven prototypes only, and the aeroplane, when I got there, had only been released up to 400 knots. Derek Whitehead was the chief test pilot, Sailor Parker was the deputy chief test pilot, there was Bobby Burns who was another test pilot, and a chap called Dick Chandler, who uh, assisted with the production test flying. We all did the same job. My terms of reference were to report to the chief test pilot and uh, work for him. When I got there, the trials were uh, proceeding uh, satisfactorily, and we had dedicated aeroplanes uh, 
for instance, 486, which was the first prototype, uh, was dedicated to performance. And 491, which was the sixth prototype, had the autopilot in it. Blackburns were very sensible in that when they got to the seventh airplane, they paused and incorporated all known modifications into the eighth aeroplane, which accounts for why when the first squadron was formed, all the cockpit layouts were identical, because no further changes were really needed to the cockpit, not significantly anyway. Blackburns, I think, did a good job with the cockpit. It was a big cockpit, but the chief test pilot was a big man, and so there was, there was plenty of room in it. The aeroplane was overweight, uh, which is uh, quite often the case in the early stages, and so there was one particular problem which uh, sticks in my mind. Where this tail is joined on to the fin, they altered the engineering and, and in so doing saved a lot of weight in the fin and tailplane together. But in the course of doing that, the junction uh, where the two joined together became fractionally fatter. Um, and this introduced a uh, problem which none of us knew about uh, until we uh, stumbled on it by mistake, really, um, uh, I happened to be flying the aeroplane at the time, and at a mark number of about uh, 0.86 or 0.87, at a height of uh, about 25,000 feet, uh, that gave an indicated airspeed of uh, about 420 knots. Uh, the aeroplane suddenly started to shake um, in a quite remarkable fashion. But then, of course, uh, one of the things you're paid for as a test pilot is then to find out what actually it was. So you then set about trying to eliminate different uh, cause, possible causes. But the reason for it was that because of that slight thickening in that area, we got shock waves forming either side of the fin. And if you had the very slightest bit of side slip on, uh, that caused them to go asymmetric. And the fact they went asymmetric caused the fin to twist. And when it twisted, because it's a swept fin, it twisted about a line like that. And that caused the fin to twist, the tailplane to rock this way, and also the tailplane to twist this way. And all that was happening at the same time. So hence there was a very severe vibration. Uh, it was cured if in later Buccaneers by putting on this bullet here, which didn't exist uh, and uh, reshaping the fairings, and that uh, sorted out the airflow, and uh, that cured it. The first deck landing was, of course, quite an event. Out of Portsmouth, full ahead in the channel, Victoria's prepared for deck landing trials. Commanding the carrier, Captain Jan Brin, was with Vice Admiral Evans, Flag Officer, Aircraft Carriers. On the programme, the first ever deck landing trials of the NA-39 Blackburn bomber. For the designer Barry Late and Blackburn's chief test pilot Derek Whitehead, this was a day they'd eagerly waited for. The NA-39 is a low-level strike aircraft, Britain's latest atom bomber. To get off the deck, the Blackburns made use of the steam catapult, a device which makes it much easier to launch aircraft even in bad weather. The first bomber away was in the hands of the test pilot. Victorious has deck mirror landing gear. Derek Whitehead came in without difficulty. Blackburn's performance figures are secret, but with the landing trials, the experts were well satisfied. One important factor, the folding air brakes. 
We lost 486, which was the first one. And this was extremely unfortunate because the failure was not part of the air was not the aeroplane itself. It, the failure was an instrument in the aeroplane, a roll blind horizon. And the cloud base was very low. The cloud tops were about 12,000 feet. The aeroplane was being flown by a chap called Sailor Parker, the deputy chief test pilot. He was climbing, and the roller blind horizon indicated that the aeroplane was beginning to roll to the right. Uh, he put the stick progressively to the left. The, there was no standby instrument for the roller blind horizon. And eventually, he had on full left stick, and the roller blind was indicating that uh, the aeroplane was rolling to the right. Uh, and when you are rolling with that rate of roll, the turn and slip indicator reads backwards. And so it was indicating to him that the aeroplane was rolling to the right when, in fact, it was rolling to the left. Uh, so as far as he was concerned, the aeroplane had gone out of control because uh, in cloud, you have no alternative but to believe your instruments. So they both bailed out. So when the flight test observer went to bail out, he was moving his hands up towards the top blind uh, to operate the seat. And the slipstream caught his arm and pulled it right back over his shoulder, pulling him up the seat a considerable amount to the extent that he could no longer reach the alternate handle which is located down here between your knees. Um, so it took him some time in the aeroplane on his own with no controls <laughs> to pull himself back down the seat so that he could reach the alternate handle which he then did and uh, Again, from examining the trace, he was in that aeroplane for at least a minute, uh, if not more, by himself. As it happened, the aeroplane was the right way up, it was still climbing, and out he went without further incident. Uh, piecing together more of the story, though there were people at the factory at Bruff, who were out in the lunch break, um, and they saw this buccaneer come out of the cloud, heading towards Hull, and it was in fact this buccaneer with nobody in it. Uh, the aeroplane then went into a lazy left turn, and turned all the way around and headed out towards open countryside, where it remained <coughs> very well trimmed very slightly nose down, and it went through a, a copse of trees, leaving a buccaneer-shaped hole in the trees, and then skidded along uh, on its belly, uh, achieving... It, it broke into three pieces. The tailplane came off. The, uh, the cockpit uh, has a bulk head uh, behind uh, the rear seat, and that broke off there and the wings and engines were uh, the third piece. The trials took several years. The, when I re uh, joined the company, the aeroplane had been flying for over a year, and the trials continued until the Navy formed the Intensive Flying Trials Unit, which was called 700Z Flight at Los Imaus. That was actually formed in March of 1961. Okay, climb. And I temporarily I'll left the company, knots. went up there to be the senior pilot of you that uh, flight. They delivered to us, over time, six development aeroplanes. And our function there was to prove the performance of the aeroplane and also to monitor the reliability of the equipment. In those days, it had a retractable flight refueling probe. Fortunately, the very clever flight refueling probe 
um, it didn't work. In to the, what I mean by that is that it was cleverly engineered, beautifully stowed, and when you flipped the switch, a panel opened in front of the cockpit windscreen. This probe came out like this. The panel closed, the probe turned around, and it sat there. But unfortunately, we discovered in later trials that when you were trying to plug this into the drogue from a flight refueling tanker, the airflow around the nose, in the most frustrating way, would push the drogue away from the probe when you were about six inches away. Um, and uh, so the Buccaneer now has a permanent probe fixed, which makes it, it which is much longer. It's further away from the fuselage and outside of that airplane, but it's so much bigger that the engineering to make it fold up and go in the same space would be uh, costly, heavy, and not worth it. So it was fixed. In the early 60s, I was appointed to the Naval Air Station at Lossiemouth to teach low-level flying, tactical reconnaissance, and photographic interpretation. And part of that job was to fly with students uh, low-level in the Hunter uh, Mark 8. I always found that a, a, a very stressful uh, situation for me uh, as an observer and navigator. Uh, a bit white knuckly in a sense that flying low level in high turbulence in the mountains is not conducive to doing your job properly. And these are speeds of 360 knots and uh, 200 feet, somewhere in that region. And then one day someone very kindly said to me, would I like to go and fly with the intensive flying trials unit? Uh, which was at Lossiemouth at the time in the Buccaneer Mark I. And of course, I jumped at this opportunity because I saw this was a way of developing my career and I had a tremendous interest in this fabulous beast. And so on the 23rd of July, 1962, at 7.15 uh, in the evening, I got airborne with a marvellous American on exchange called Bill Foote. And we were soon airborne and on the low-level routes and doing 420 knots at 200 feet, and I didn't even know it. It was a fantastic stable platform and it was unbelievable because part of the job of the observer and navigator is to work in an atmosphere uh, that's closed, it's taut and it's comforting with a good pilot and you can do your job to 100% ability and suddenly here I'd found it we were stable and we could have gone up to 480 520 knots with no problem at all the other thing I liked about it this airplane as a weapon system platform is the all-round look. I could see over the pilot's shoulder. I could see what was going on ahead. It was very, very comforting. And it was very upsetting to me to subsequently find I was then appointed to helicopters and couldn't carry on my career in this marvellous beast. When I'd finished my training to become an air engineer, I'd, I went to Lossiemouth um, for my first job in the beginning of 1966. And uh, I joined 801 Squadron, which had just formed from the Intensive Flying Trials Unit. The Buccaneer was designed for the Navy to deliver a nuclear weapon at sea to deal with major Russian uh, surface units. The weapon we developed over a period of time, there was a range of conventional weapons from rockets to 500 and 1,000 pound conventional bombs and uh, the same weapons could have been VT fused, which are proximity fuses. And the fundamental weapon, of course, was the 2,000 pound marker bomb, which was the uh, long tossed delivery weapon, 2,000 pound nuclear weapon. Well, the, the original long toss delivery mode was obviously not suitable for conventional weapons, and when it came into service, there was a, an attack which roughly meant diving towards the target at around an, an elevation of 15 degrees called dive toss. That showed itself over evaluation um, to be somewhat risky, and uh, we developed a depressed sightline bombing which enabled you to approach the target far lower and at a much safer. And that became the, pri the primary delivery method for conventional weapons. It was a very versatile aeroplane. In a <coughs> normal um, squadron, uh, you would have, in our Navy, 14 aeroplanes. Uh, two of those Typically, two of those would be configured as air-to-air -air refueling tankers, and one 
would be configured in the photographic role, and the rest would be configured uh, in the weapons role for whatever weapons you wanted. And the squadrons would be required to become proficient in everything up to a certain standard. And then you would further specialise pilots and observers uh, to being uh, particularly uh, good at certain roles that you thought you would be needing in the theatre to which you were sent. Uh, because one of the functions of an aircraft carrier is that it's carrying a whole airfield with it. And it has a fighter squadron on board, and it has an anti-submarine helicopter squadron on board, and it has this strike capability. So it is carrying with it an ability to establish air superiority in its own environment. They're very complete systems, which is why the Eastern Bloc took such a tremendous interest in them, because they were worried by them. I think that uh, to have a force in being just over the horizon uh, captures the attention of potential troublemakers in terms of preventing uh, small conflicts or which could quickly escalate into bigger conflicts. They're exceedingly useful. Um, so when you can produce this amount of power quickly on somebody's doorstep when they're about to make trouble which is going to up upset the stability of the international scene, aircraft carriers are extremely useful. And uh, I think that the combination of phantoms and buccaneers and anti-submarine helicopters that we had uh, helped in many instances to keep the peace. In fact, HMS Art Royal, that, uh, that, that's the previous Art Royal, the, the, the one that was commissioned in 1955 and went out of commission in 1978. She never fired a shot in anger, but she was in the right place at the right time, preventing a lot of things, undesirable things from happening, and preventing quite a lot of uh, brush fire wars from escalating into uh, destabilizing arrangements for the rest of the world. One of the times when the buccaneer was uh, very useful uh, with its long legs was in Belize. The, the Ark Royal was over 500 miles away, but it was essential because the bad guys were beginning to flex their muscles, it was essential to calm things down. And so four buccaneers were flown off from the Ark Royal. Two of them were tankers and two of them were in the ground attack role. And they refueled on the way out. And the tankers came back and landed back on board and refueled themselves on board, and they were then launched again to meet the two buccaneers on their way back. Uh, but by having those buccaneers visibly flying over Belize, it demonstrated that there was an aircraft carrier not very far away. And in fact, it was a long way away, but the effect that it had was exactly what was hoped for, and the trouble ceased. And the, the carrier was, in fact, within easy range the following day, by which time the trouble had gone away. But the effect of those two aeroplanes flying that distance and appearing at the scene of operations uh, did work very well. Well, certainly when it was being operated by the Royal Navy, 
It was held in very high regard by the American Navy when we were operating and cross-operating together. Um, I think it's nice to uh, reflect that in 1978 it won the Salmon Trophy in competition with the Jaguars, an aircraft that had come into service some 10 to 15 years later. in the Far East and uh, the humidity is considerably higher based in Singapore and uh, some of the more experienced air crew in the squadron were apprehensive about a, a feeling of stiction in the flying controls and uh, at Blackburn a lot of investigation was carried out and we then ended up with a major engineering challenge of rebuilding each cockpit by changing the race bearings in the flying controls in the cockpit and that was a fascinating engineering challenge to carry out about 12,000 miles from England. The difference between the Mark I and the Mark II uh, was quite marked. Uh, the, the Mark I was a, a very easy aeroplane to fly. It had single spool engines, which means that the thrust from the engines uh, increases or decreases very quickly as, as you move the throttles. With the Mark II, you had twin spool engine and when you moved the throttles the HP compressor wound up very quickly but the thrust was related to the LP compressor and that followed in its own sweet time so there was a lag between moving the throttles and getting what you'd asked for nothing spectacular but noticeable you became uh, familiar with this, obviously, but uh, I found the Mark I was much easier uh, to land in Canada than the Mark II. But when you flew the Mark II enough, then that's all you knew. You became used to it, and uh, it became perfectly easy. But the, the Mark I was definitely easier. As far as fuel consumption was concerned, uh, that was the most dramatic uh, improvement with the Mark II, which could go very much further on the same amount of fuel uh, than the Mark I. And uh, also, the engine thrust available from the Spey engines in the Mark II was a lot more than was available in the Mark I, to the extent that we were never allowed to land back on board normally with a engine failure in a Mark I. We were either diverted ashore or else we were covered into the barrier. Whereas you could do a single engine uh, overshoot uh, in the Mark II quite easily. But so a lot of people will tell you that the Mark I was underpowered it all depends what you were flying before as to how that affects you.
taking off and landing from an aircraft carrier is uh, a, a very exhilarating experience. Uh, it is far less difficult than people think it is. When you're launched from the carrier, you're launched hands off. Uh, that means that you have in fact got your left hand holding the throttles forward to make sure that they won't come back with the force of going down the catapult. With your right hand, you're not touching the stick at all. The aeroplane is properly trimmed and you just leave your right hand on your knee. And uh, when, after you've been launched, then with no great hurry, you just take over the aeroplane and fly it away. Um, and it's very, very easy indeed. Uh, obviously, you're going to pull up the wheels and the flaps and that sort of thing uh, as you accelerate away. The steam catapult is a great advance on earlier catapults, and the ride that you get is very smooth. As far as landing the aeroplane is concerned, again, people think it's, it looks frightfully difficult. It's nothing like as difficult as it appears you are interested in three specific aspects. One is speed, one is the centre line, and the other is the glide slope. The centre line is quite easy to see because it's painted down the centre of the flight deck and uh, usually in day glow red. The speed is easy to see because the airspeed indicator is uh, up specifically placed up on the combing uh, where you can see it out of the corner of your eye. As far as the glide slope is concerned, there's uh, what started life as a mirror site where a light was shone into a mirror which reflected back towards the pilot and halfway up the mirror in either side were a row of green lights. So there was a mirror in the centre and poking out either side was this row of green lights. And if you were going high on the glide slope, the reflected white light in the mirror would move upwards. So you made a correction to bring it back again. And if you were low on the glide slope, so it moved downwards. It was all great fun. We felt it was an enormous challenge. We were competing with the other squadrons, the Buccaneers, to make sure that our particular squadron, in my case 801 and 803 squadrons, were the best. And I look back and it probably is my best time in the Navy. The Royal Air Force uh, did not initially take the Buccaneer. As far as I'm aware, I think the main reason was that they had the TSR-2 coming along and when money is as short as it always is for defence, to 
take the buccaneer uh, could very well have uh, led the Treasury to believe that the TSR-2 was not necessary and therefore it gave uh, them more chance to cancel the TSR-2. In the event, the TSR-2 was cancelled. That was replaced, in theory, by the F-111 from the United States. Then that was cancelled and the Royal Air Force then got the Royal Navy's buccaneers when the fleet air arm ceased having conventional aircraft carriers and they got some of their own. aircraft were handed over from the Navy, um, which really occurred during the 70s, the, the Air Force deployed them in two ways. Firstly, to provide a maritime strike capability, and then secondly, in Central Europe, to be able to have the ability to strike deep into enemy territory. The exercises we'll be carrying out will be a low-level transit at 200 feet ASL en route to the target area, and en route obtaining a tactical direction from our Nimrod, which is mission Tango Oscar 99. The rendezvous, the rejoin after the attack, will be a Romeo 2, and from the Romeo 2, transiting low level back to base 200 feet for a visual recovery, VMC recovery through Point Alpha. Based at Honington and Suffolk, and equipped with ex Royal Navy aircraft, 12 Squadron was reformed in 1969 as the RAF's first Buccaneer Squadron. 15 and 16 Squadrons followed in 1970 and 73 respectively and formed the Buccaneer element of RAF Germany within the second Allied Tactical Air Force. By 1979, two further squadrons, 208 and 216, as well as an operational conversion unit had been formed in the UK. In 1980, the first Tornado Weapons Conversion Unit formed at Honington and the two Buccaneer squadrons moved to RAF Lossiemouth. In Scotland, their main area of attention was the potential movement of the ever-expanding Russian Navy around Norway, Iceland and the Faroes. In Germany, flying from RAF Lago, they were ranged against the Russians in an overland strike world where, if needed, they would have struck deep into hostile country at low level. In the mid-80s, they were replaced by Tornado GR1s, thus leaving only the UK-based Buccaneers in service. Until 1991, the Buccaneer had acted successfully as a deterrent, but had never fired a shot in anger. However, an urgent call to RAF Lossiemouth saw the dispatch of 12 Buccaneers from 12 and 208 squadrons, plus 237 OCU to Muharraq and Bahrain, to act as laser target markers for the tornadoes in the Gulf War. Carrying the American paved spike daytime laser designators, they flew 216 sorties, guiding some 169 laser-guided bombs to attack bridges and airfields. They carried a sidewinder missile for defence, but later they dispensed with this and started guiding their own 1,000-pound bombs. This successful operation in the Gulf provided a fitting climax to the career of the Buccaneer. I think you'll find, practically to a man, the Royal Air Force pilots that flew the Buccaneers liked them a great deal.
In almost 20 years, the factory at Bruff delivered 209 aircraft, including 40 Mark I's and 84 Mark II's for the Royal Navy and 45 Mark II B's for the RAF. Finally, on the 6th of October 1977, the last buccaneer left the production line. Just over 16 years later, on the 15th of October 1993, a Buccaneer S Mark II, serial number XV168, flying from RAF Lossiemouth, landed at Bruff to mark the end of its active service with the RAF. This landing in itself was unique, as it was the first Buccaneer ever to fly into or out of Bruff. The aircraft, whether they were prototypes for delivery to the test airfield at home on Spalding Moor, or production Buccaneers for the services, had always been delivered by road. XV-168 had had a varied career. Delivered to the Navy on the 13th of December 1966, it served with 801 Squadron for three years before joining the RAF and becoming one of the original aircraft in 12 Squadron. In 1985, it was transferred to 208 Squadron, where it completed its service life. Having flown over 6,000 hours, it had doubled its initial design life. The pilot was squadron leader Rick Phillips from 208, and the navigator was Group Captain Nigel Maddox, commander of 12 Squadron. Jointly, they have over 5,000 hours in Buccaneers. This 27-year-old aircraft will be permanently displayed at Bruff as a symbol of the past, a focus for the future, and a fitting tribute to those designers and engineers who conceived and built the Buccaneer. At its inception, the Buccaneer was an innovative, high-performance strike aircraft built for a specific role within the Royal Navy. For 30 years, it has proved to be a versatile, reliable and formidable aircraft, able to carry a wide range of weaponry, perform a variety of roles for both the Navy and the RAF, and finally, prove its ability to fight during the Gulf War. 1994 saw the final withdrawal from service of this great airport. It was an aircraft which I grew to love. But most of the guys who fly it have a, a great confidence in the aeroplane. It's uh, very popular with its crew. The aircraft was being flown by Derek Whitehead. I think we were enormously lucky in, in having such a, such a wonderful pilot. I certainly had this faith that this aeroplane would always get me home. So I had a tremendous liking for it, which I still have today. Um, and uh, I, well, I shall always feel very happy about my association with it. And um, uh, I'm sorry that it's going out of service, but everything has to finish somewhere.